So last time we talked about the composition of the concrete. We say it's going to be composed of cement, aggregate, water, and additives. Also, we call it admixtures. Also, I talked briefly about the difference between a code section and specification. A specification is like ASTM C33. ASTM stands for American Standard for Testing and Materials. What this organization is doing, they publish this specification. So for each material that you may think about using it or working with it, you're going to see an ASTM number. Also, for any test that you may think is going to be done in our business, it's going to have also an ASTM number. For example, for this normal weight aggregate, in order for you to call a material, any given material, to call it normal weight aggregate, it needs compliance with the requirements of the ASTM C33 in terms of chemical composition, mechanical properties, color, the whole thing, the shape, the size. So if you like to call this material normal wheel aggregate, it needs to comply with all the requirements of this specification. Same thing for the reinforcing bars. Same thing for water that you are going to be using in your concrete mix. For any additive, you are going to see that it has an ASTM number for it. Now for the fine aggregate, which means a sand, there's certain stuff that you need to be aware of. Like for example, it can be natural or manufactured, sand, or mix. It's going to be OK, as long as you're going to be satisfying certain grading requirements. It should be clean of any clay or any organic materials. This can be very important. Just so you guys know, if you have one cubic yard of concrete and you just put half of a spoon of sugar on it, it's going to be nothing. You're going to convert it into sand. Once you start to load it, it's going to be almost nothing. So any organic material is going to be really harmful to concrete. If you put any chemicals with sodium, like sodium chloride, this is going to be very, very bad when it comes to the reinforcing and the concrete itself. It's going to cause rust of the steel the rebars, and also it's going to deteriorate the concrete once you start to put it in. And let's say that you put it during the mix, you just wait maybe a couple of months, and the concrete is going to be really in bad shape. So you got to be careful about these materials. The grading is going to be very important. I'm sure that you guys are aware of the sieve analysis. This is at which you're going to be taking a sample of the sand or the aggregate, whether it's going to be fine or coarse. So as we said, fine aggregate means sand, coarse aggregate is going to be rock or gravel. And you're going to be doing the sieve analysis. And your sieve analysis needs to satisfy certain requirements in the STM C33. You need to have certain grading. You cannot have it all of the same size. You need to have big size particles, average or medium, and small size aggregate. Otherwise, you cannot really have this uh, concrete as, as a material. For the coarse aggregate, absolutely, it needs to be clean. I mean, and, and just, you know, in, when you have um, like concrete uh, supplier in, in a patch planet or in in a factory that, that gives you this concrete, they take the gravel and then they wash it. They wash it with regular water, stab water. And of course, this stab water needs to be uh, clean of any chlorides or clay. And would that de clean it? As you see here, it says clean of chlorides, as you see. And it cannot, because the chlorides can be very harmful to concrete. Now, also, the size of the aggregate is going to be very critical. We call it the maximum, which is this piece here. They call it maximum or nominal maximum aggregate size. You don't want to use big rock when you are producing concrete because of a few issues. One of them is going to be the size of the beam or the structural element. For example, if you have the forms, it's going to be very close to each other. And just imagine that you put a big piece of rock inside. What's going to happen? The concrete and cement is not going to be going around this, this piece of rock. And you're going to have a problem here because this is going to be like a weak point in the beam itself. This is why it says here the maximum size of the aggregate piece, and of course, this is going to be to the rock and gravel, 
is going to be one fifth of the smallest dimension between sides of forms. So let's say if the beam width, let's say six inch, you take this six inch divided by five, it's going to be 1.2 inches, and this gives you the maximum aggregate size that you can use in this concrete mix. Also, it needs to be smaller than one third of the slab depth. So if the slab thickness, let's say, is four inches only, you make one third of this, is going to be 1.33 inch. This gives you the maximum aggregate size. Or it's going to be three quarter of the minimum clear bar spacing. So let's say that I have a concrete slab, and or beam and the spacing between bars is about two inches, the clear spacing, right? So take this three quarter of the two inches, it's gonna be one and a half, and this is gonna be the maximum aggregate size. In our business here, we have two standard sizes that we use. We have three eighths of an inch and three quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna say here, the first size is gonna be three eighths of an inch. And usually we use this when it comes to concrete slabs and thin elements. The other size that you may have, or you may see, is gonna be three quarter of an inch. It's gonna be the maximum size of the aggregate. So it is true that this condition may say that it's okay to be using an inch or inch and quarter or inch and a half, but the very available um, aggregate uses is gonna be three quarter, three quarter of an inch, and sometimes also one inch. The first one here we call pea gravel, the three eighth of an inch. It is called as pea gravel. It is very small and it is very good because it gives you a concrete that can flow in any structural element, whether it's gonna be big or small. So let's say that if you have foundation, I'm expecting that amount of rebar is not gonna be that heavy. So I'm expecting it's gonna be maybe an inch. It's gonna be okay to use an inch. But once it goes to columns, concrete slabs and beams, I would rather use three quarter of an inch if you have very small element, like very thin element of concrete, I will go with three eight one inch. Now, where is the information coming from? It is coming from the ACI, and here's the section number. So this gave you like a code issue when it comes to the selection of the aggregate size. And you need to understand the reason why it is gonna be a big issue. Because the concrete member size is gonna be the slab thickness and the clear spacing between the rebars. Now, at the end of the day, you are going to be working with concrete element, and the weight is going to be important for us, the weight of the concrete member itself. So we have something that we call here normal weight aggregate, and then we have lightweight aggregate. What is normal weight aggregate? Is an aggregate that weight about the aggregate itself. It's going to be about 140 pounds per cubic foot. So this PCF means pound per cubic foot. Unit weight of the aggregate itself, normal weight aggregates, give about 140. We have another aggregate that we call here lightweight aggregate, which weighs about 70 pound per cubic foot. What is the use? What is the difference? In all construction, we'd like to use normal weight aggregate. It is easy to find, it is cheaper, and you just, uh, you'd like to stay with this. If you like to switch to lightweight aggregate, you're going to be paying more. So lightweight aggregate is going to be here more expensive. So you say, okay, why would you go to lightweight aggregate if this is more expensive? You can say because of the weight of the building itself. When we ask concrete members to support the structures or to support loads, it's going to be supporting its self weight. It's going to be number one, plus additional loads that is going to come to it. The self weight of the structure, we call this dead load. Other loads, we're going to call it here life load. So the first component of the dead load is going to be the self weight of the structure member itself. So when it comes to certain type of construction, we'd like to get to lighter structures. It's going to be because we'd like to reduce the weight of the entire building. How do you reduce it? You switch to lightweight aggregate but you're going to pay, pay more. So the question is, is it worth it? I'm going to say in certain cases, yes. But we'll try to avoid this as much as we can. If you have a building made out of structured steel, like a steel building, you know, and it has concrete slab, most likely this is going to be lightweight concrete. 
we don't usually, I mean, when it comes to steel construction, when you have a floor that you need to walk in on, it's gonna be most likely lightweight aggregate or lightweight concrete. Now, in the first case here, when you use normal weight concrete, the total weight of the concrete as a unit weight is gonna be ranging between 145 to 150 PCR. For the sake of this course, in, usual, in practice, we use this number only. Let me put here a box around it. When it comes to weight calculations, I'm gonna be using 150 pound per cubic foot. If the problem here says use lightweight concrete, here's the weight that you need to use, 115 pound per cubic foot. So you have here two values that we're gonna be working with. It is true that says 145. And if you go to a concrete supplier, he may give you lighter, maybe 140, maybe 142. In some cases, 152. But we're going to say a good value to use is give you this 150. This should be good enough. Any questions? We're good? All right. This is the water itself. The water it has certain specifications. You cannot just use any water. We have also an ASTM for the water to be used in concrete mixing. Why is that? Because we need to limit the amount of chlorides, oils, acids, organic materials. You need to limit it. And this is all included in the ASTM number here. Once you go to the ASTM document, maybe this document, two, three pages, is going to include all the chemical composition, properties, the color, and the whole thing. Generally speaking, we say if you are able to drink this water, it should be good for concrete. It doesn't mean that you're gonna bring here bottled water, right? But tap water should be fine. Let's say that you're doing a small project at home and you decide here to buy some concrete from the Home Depot or any place, tap water should be fine. Admixtures. So again, why do we use admixtures or additives? For the following. We would like to have this air and training admixtures. This is gonna be very good for workability. Workability means when you take the concrete and you try to put it in a column, and the column size is not that big, it has lots of rebars. Of course, you're gonna vibrate the concrete to let it sit in and, and fill all the holes in there, right? So in a case like this, if the amount of water that you added to the concrete is like 0.45, it's gonna be very tough to work with this concrete. The concrete is gonna be very dry, but this is what you need. You cannot add more water. Adding more water is gonna make the concrete weaker, as you guys know. So what is the option for this? Or what can we do about it? We're going to be adding an admixture or one of these additives to increase workability. Also, if you'd like to reduce the amount of cement, because the problem with cement, it is a high shrink material. So the problem with cement here, you bring some water and you put it to cement and you let it sit there. Two, three hours, you're going to see it full of cracks. Why? Because it is a material that has this high shrinkage properties. So some people would say, we'd like to reduce the amount of cracks developed in the concrete. So what do we do? We're gonna say adding the aggregate like sand and rock is gonna reduce the shrinkage and reduce the cracks. It makes sense. But you still have lots of cement. If I'm aiming for high trans concrete, I need to add lots of cement. So the way around this is to take a portion of the cement and substitute with either silica fume or fly ash. So these two materials, we may call it here cementitious material. So they are similar to cement. So you can reduce the amount of cement and add the fly ash or the silica fume. So what's the purpose of adding silica fume and fly ash? Is give it to reduce the amount of cement used and reduce the total shrinkage of the concrete at the end. Also, we have this plasticizers. Generally speaking, we have this type of additives that we call here plasticizers, and the reason we add them is to increase workability of the concrete. So if you'd like to work in an easy way with concrete, what you need to do is to find some of these plasticizers, which is available. I mean, this is easy to find. You can buy it and you can just add it. For a concrete supplier, they have it in the planet. They have tons of these materials. And it's just gonna you know, be up to you. For each concrete mix, they have a number for it. What you need to do is just order it and they're gonna, it's gonna come ready with all the admixtures. This means when you order the concrete, when you buy it and it comes to the side, it's gonna be including all of this. It's gonna be fluid, concrete, and it's gonna come with all the admixtures needed according to your order. 
So you don't really need to add this at the site. Everything is going to be coming to you ready just for you to put it in the form. A professor, are yes. the plasticizers uh, relatively expensive or? No, don't forget that you're going to be adding tons of it. There's going to be a very limited amount that you just add there to reach certain, certain workability. But mm, okay. it is not like very expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you, you like to gain high strength concrete, this is where the cost is going to happen usually. Um, because you need to be sure that the, the amount of produced heat is not going to be cracking the concrete. So it has a special design. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. Thank you. So two ways of mixing it. If you have a small project, you can do it this way. Very small project that you do it in your backyard, you can do it this way. But if you have real project, this is the way that you do it. You just purchase the concrete. And you see the silos? They are full of cement and aggregate and just mix it here by a, with a computer system. Actually, no person is going to get involved in the amount of water added to it or the weight of cement and weight of aggregate is going to be done with Matthew. Matthew, do you have any questions? Or no? No, you're good? All right, great. All right. So what do we care about concrete? I mean, what's gonna be the important things in the concrete itself as a material when it comes to our concrete design? We care about the strength. And usually we say the strength at 28 days. So what is the strength at 28 days? As you guys know, we're gonna have cylinders of concrete samples. We're gonna put it in a testing machine, put pressure on it till it fades. And then we're going to record the highest stress that the machine was able to get to or to attain. And then we're going to say, this spaceman here was able to take up to 3,000 PSI. So what does it mean by 3,000 PSI? It means this is going to be the trends at 28 days from the day that you have casted the concrete in the form. So on the same day that you cast the concrete, you're going to be taking a few samples. Concrete samples are going to be like cylinders. You're going to be testing it, take it to the machine, do the test, record the value, and this is going to be the concrete strength. Why 28 days? This could be the question. Why not 30 days? It is that simple because let's say that you pour the concrete on Tuesday and you don't want to forget which day is going to be the 30th day. So you say, I poured it on Tuesday, and four weeks from now is going to be also Tuesday. This is going to be the day that I should expect the test results to come by. Or if you are testing it, you just take it to the test. So I mean, nothing uh, magical about the 28 days. It's that simple. At 28 days, you're going to be reaching the specified concrete strength. What does it mean by specified? It means the one that you ordered. When I order concrete, I need to specify or state what strength I'm, looking, I'm going to be looking for. For example, here it says 1,000 PSI concrete, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 PSI. So all of this number here is going to be in PSI. If you like to convert it into KSI, which means kip per square inch, you just divide this by 1,000. You see here, it's going to be 6,000, which means this curve, it goes to 6. 5,000, it goes to 5,000. When you do the test, you're going to put the spaceman in the machine. You're going to start to put loads like pressure, and then figure out the stress by taking the load divided by the cross-section area of the cylinder or the spaceman. And with that, you're going to be recording the stress at different points of loading. So let's say I ordered 4,000 PSI concrete. I'm going to be following this curve here. Just going to this one here. So what's going to happen? At the beginning, you start the loading, right? And the machine is working. The spaceman or the concrete sample is good. You see what happens? You have this is going to be the stress versus the strain. The strain means the amount of a change of the space when, let's say, height. So if you can figure out the change in the height divided by the original height of the space when, this is going to be the strain. It is going to be unitless, right? It's going to be inch per inch. It's going to be unitless. And you see the amount of the strain is going to be very small. You see, when the concrete is going to be reaching the maximum point, it's going to be almost at the strain of 0 0.002. Just imagine the change in the spaceman height is going to be about 0 0.002 of the original height. So the change is going to be very small. We're not talking about here big strain. 
is going to be extremely low stream values. And then at certain point, the concrete here looks what look what happened. It's going to collapse here. It's going to fail. At near about maybe 0 0.004, 0 0.004, the concrete is going to fail. And look what happened to the strength. It's going to be reaching the 4,000, the specified. It's going to drop down. So what is the 4,000? The 4,000 is going to be the maximum specified threads that the spaceman or the concrete is going to be able to support for you. Now, the code says any concrete we're going to start to be collapsing once the strain is reaching 0 0.003. So we're going to say up to here, look at this, 0.03. This means all of this concrete mixes, right? Whether it's going to be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, any value, it's going to be considered to be failed once the strain is going to be approaching 0.03. So it's not really based on the strength. No, it's going to be based on the amount of strain. And this is going to be a very important issue for us, this 0.03. Once we see here the analysis, once we start to do the analysis, we're going to say the concrete considered to be failed at 0.03 strain value. It's going to be, of course, unitless. The question is, but I see here the concrete is still working up to 0.04. You can say, I understand that. But to be conservative, we're going to say concrete is failing at 0.03. So what concrete is available in the market? Are you going to go there and order a 1,000 PSI concrete? I'm going to say no. 2,000, no. The smallest usually is going to be 2,500 PSI. And look at this. Typical concrete strength ranges from 2,500 PSI to 6,000 PSI. Like to order concrete, this is going to be the standard. If you order this, this is available. All of their, this is where all the pads are. Okay. They're going to sell out because we're on vacation. Yes, Matthew? Do you have a question, Matthew? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So again, the available strength in the market is going to be somewhere between 2,500 to 6,000. You can order 4,500, 5,500, you're going to see they're available, right? 3,500, 3,000, 4,000, you can order all of that. Now, if you like to go higher than 6,000, you can. Let's say up to 20,000 PSI. We call this high performance concrete, HPC. It's going to be the higher trans concrete. But this is going to be really expensive. Just so you know, once you reach 5,000, it's going to be kind of expensive to go to 5,000. If you go 2,500, this is going to be the cheapest. And usually if you are doing like a backyard slab or a driveway or a little bit of slab and grade, you can just go ahead and use 2,500. If you go to concrete columns in a building, maybe I'm going to go to 5,000 PSI. So this 6,000 is kind of going to be a little bit expensive. So I don't want to go there. I'd like to keep it maybe 4,000, 5,000 for structure members, for flat work, like on the slab and grade, stuff like this. I'm going to go here with 2,500 PSI. So again, I'm saying here, normal weight concrete weights about 150 pound per cubic foot. And the weight of the lightweight concrete, unit weight, is going to be 110 or 115. I'm going to specify it, but if it is not given, you can go ahead here and use, let's say, according to this, it's going to be 110. So but generally speaking, I will specify, but if this gave you normal weight, it's going to be 150. Yes, Alex? Uh, so you mentioned that the 2,500 PSI to 6,000 PSI is recommended for non-reinforced, for flat work, correct? No, what I'm saying is 2,500 is recommended for flat work. Mm-hmm. If you go foundation, I may go 3,000 mm, okay. for a small house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say 6,000 or 5,000 and use it in unreinforced concrete or non-reinforced. I will never do this. Mm -hmm. So once you go to 3,000, it means that you have reinforcing and it's going to be kind of important structure that you'd like to take care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, no problem. So what is this curve again? This curve is a relationship between the stress and the strain of the concrete center. You see here, start at zero point. It grows as long as you apply load to the concrete center, to the cylinder. And then after that, it drops down. All right. So I'm going to say, 
what is the slope of the first line here? This is going to be the modulus of loss testing of the concrete. We call this E sub C. What is this? This is going to be stress units divided by strain units because the slope of this line is going to be called E sub C. Again, it's going to be the Y component divided by the X component. Y component is KSI or PSI. X component is unitless. So at the end, units for E sub C is going to be what? Units for this one is going to be same as a stress, meaning PSI or KSI. What is PSI? Pump per square inch. KSI, K per square inch. If you are working with concrete, all the ACI code is going to be based on PSI units which means everything needs to be in pounds, everything needs to be in inches. Someone's gonna say, how about this pump per cubic foot? You say, yeah, this is fine, I understand. But when you look at the code equation, this is not a code equation, right? If you look at any code equation, units needs to be pounds and inches. You cannot do any other units in the code equations. So I'm gonna say, what does it mean? I have this in 150, I'm gonna say, this is fine. Figure out the weight, Make it in kips, make the moment to be in kip foot. At the end, be sure that you convert into pounds once you get to a code equation. All the code equations are designed and built for only PSI, not for KSI. Remember this, or KSF, like kip per square foot, it is not designed for that. I'm going to show you some examples once come to analysis to be sure that you guys you follow the same uh, units we use in concrete design. Here's a copy and paste section of the ACI code. It gives you here the limits for F prime C. What is F prime C? I'm gonna say F prime C is a concrete strength. If I go back here, look at this. It says compressive strength. This when you test the sample, the spacement, it's gonna be F prime C. So you can see what does it mean by F prime C? It, it is called here specified compressive strength. So let me point on some stuff here. F usually it used for stress. Okay. C, usually it's used for, not compression. It's gonna be for concrete. And the prime is gonna be for compression. So now we understand the source of each one of these elements. F prime C. F stress prime compression. C is gonna be for concrete. All right, if you have any concrete members, it says here general, and I have here normal weight and lightweight concrete, the minimum value that you can use in reinforced concrete is gonna be 2,500 PSI. If it's 2,000, you cannot really use it. Our equations wouldn't apply to you. So you have to have at least 2,500 PSI concrete. And for the maximum, there's no limit. As long as you can produce it, order it, this is fine. But I told you here about the range. What is available in the market? This gave you this range. If you'd like to go to 20,000, it's gonna be high performance concrete. This is gonna be really expensive, right? But there is no limit, actually. There's something here that says special mode frames, special structure walls. I'm gonna say this is for member resisting earthquake forces. So I'm not gonna be working on this. This is what I care about. Our minimum is 2,500 and we don't have a max. All right, so forget about this. I want you to keep track of what I'm saying because you're gonna have a homework. It's gonna be all simple questions about your understanding to what I've just said in this slide set. So, okay, great. So we have this usually, this lambda factor. What is this lambda factor? This lambda factor here to take into account the effect of the use of lightweight aggregate and lightweight concrete. We have something here that we call all lightweight. What does it mean by all lightweight? Now, don't forget that we have two components for the aggregate, right? We have fine aggregate and coarse aggregate. Fine aggregate like the sand, it could be natural or manufactured. Coarse 
and the other aggregate, the coarse aggregate, could be gravel or rock. If the gravel and the sand, all lightweight, all of them, both of these two aggregates is lightweight, your lambda factor is 0.75. If it is all normal weight, all aggregates gave a normal weight, you're going to end up with 1.0, which means if you have normal weight, no reduction to the strength. So this is actually not good. When you have lower lambda, this is not good. It means that we have reduction here to the strength. This is why we'd like to avoid the use of lightweight concrete as much as we can in our analysis. We'd like to stay with this normal weight concrete so we don't really have any reduction in the strength. The reduction usually is going to be applied to the term square root of f prime c. What's f prime c? Concrete strength. In certain code equations, once you see the square root of f prime c, lambda is going to be used with it. So we'd like to stay here. It's normally with concrete. But if you have to go with light with concrete, I'm going to go with this. Now, because we have two components, sand and gravel or rock, fine aggregate and coarse aggregate, someone's going to say, how about if the sand is going to be light and the rock is going to be normal? Or the rock is going to be light and the sand is going to be normal. I'm going to say, look at this. We have some combination, right? But for us, if we're going to be doing a design problem, we're going to say either that you go normal or you go light. Use one or 0.75. We don't want to be confused. Especially in practice, if I know that they're going to be using lightweight concrete, most likely the contractor is going to say, I'd like to use all lightweight. It's just simpler for him. He doesn't want to be confused. Not to add a lightweight component and normal weight component, let's just do all lightweight. And if he used sand lightweight only and normal weight for the rock, it's going to be 0.85. I know I'm going to be safe in my analysis because it's going to be reduction, right? So if I stay here with a 0.75 in my analysis, I cover myself. If the contractor is planning to use light with concrete, it's going to be 0.75. I'm good. I'm covered. So if he used one of these, I'm going to say, you know what? This is good because now the trend is going to be higher when we use only 0.85 in reality. Otherwise, I would say just to say it was normal with concrete. How about if the analysis doesn't say if this is normal weight or light weight, which way should I go? What is the default? I'm going to say default is going to be the normal weight. If no one mentioned anything about the concrete, it's going to be normal weight. All right? You're good? All right? Now, the reinforcing bars. You know, when you have a piece of reinforcing bars, the steel, and you test it, you put it in the test machine, you start to apply tension to it. And look at this. I see it in concrete samples, we put compression because concrete actually is going to be very weak in tension. Concrete is good in compression. Steel is good in tension and compression. But in compression, the problem is it's going to buckle. This is going to be our problem. It's going to be the buckling. Why? Because the rebar itself is going to be like this pen or this pencil. It's going to be one dimensional element. Once you start to put lots of pressure on it, it's going to buckle. How to stop it from buckling? You just contain it in concrete. So the concrete surrounding the rebar is going to reduce that buckling that may happen to it. So I'm going to say, if you like to test a piece of rebar, why would you put compression on it? Because now you don't have any concrete around it. So I'm going to say, in a case like this, we're going to do a tension test. So this here is going to be tension test. In the tension test, we're going to be plotting here this diagram between on the x-axis is going to be the strain, and the strain is going to be unitless, is going to be inch per inch. And on the y-axis is going to be stress, like it's going to be in P psi or K psi. Very similar to the concrete. If you recall this concrete, stress versus strain. Same thing, stress versus strain. Usually the strain is going to be on the x-axis, and the stress is going to be on the y-axis. So, all right, at the beginning, we're going to have this elastic performance of the steel. And then at certain points, it's going to start to yield. So we call this going to be the yield line or point. It's going to be the yield point. And then 
you apply tension to the machine, you see here lots of strains. You see the strains? And the machine is not picking up. There is no resistance to the rebar. Till it hits a point, we call this the strain hardening point. The rebar is going to start to resist the tension again. Till it reaches here the maximum strength. And then after that, it's going to drop a little bit. And then the spaceman is going to collapse. It's going to snap off here at this point. Because it's going to be the failure point. So the stress at this point here, we call the yield stress. Why the yield stress? Because it's going to be the stress at which the yield is going to happen. And this is going to be very important for us. This is what we are going to be using in our design. How about ES? What is ES? The slope of this line. It's going to be the modulus plus testing. And it is a standard of 29,000 KSI. So you can see the slope of this line Standard of 29,000 KSI. K per square inch. Because the slope of this line is going to be equal to the Y component divided by the X component. Y component is going to be stress units. X component is going to be unitless. So take a stress divided by 1 is going to be equal to stress units. KSI or PSI. It's going to be either one of the two. Okay. What is standard values for F sub Y that you'd like to use? You remember in concrete, what did we say? 2,500, maybe 3,000, 3,500, 4,000. You can order whatever you need in your N answer. And here we have three values, three typical values. As you see here, it's going to be 40 KSI for the yield. You see the typical yield trends, 40. 60 and 75. Which one is available? Nowadays, if I like to place an order, you can say stay with this. The 60,000. Let's give you the common. Is 40 KSI available? I'm going to say no. Not anymore. It used to be in the past. Let's say in the 60s and 50s. It used to be 50 and 40 KSI. And then later on, 60 came. And I would say maybe starting 1970s, there's no 40 KSI. But just in case, if you have an old reinforcing bars, an existing project, then you know that it could be 40 KSI, rebar, not really 60. So this is what's really going to be available if you'd like to play some more. So what is the 75? I'm going to say 75 in some cases. You may order it and use it. It's okay, you can use it. But it's gonna be a little bit expensive and not really available in the market. So I would say if I'm doing any design, it's gonna be a 60K sign. How about if the problem doesn't say, what should I do? Like in the homework or project or the exam, it means it's gonna be 60K sign by default. This is gonna be the conventional enforcement bar that we use. Now, the reinforcing bars is going to be satisfying one of these two ASTM specifications. You can see what this means by ASTM. Again, American Standards for Testing and Materials. A615 is one document. You open it, you're going to see all the information you need to know about this repo. I cannot, for example, bring this pen and then call it, this is like a rebar. You're going to say, this is not steel. You can say what constitutes a steel for you. How do you define a steel? How do you define this to be a steel A615, a piece of rebar? You can say you have lots of things. You have chemical properties, chemical composition. You need to be within certain limits. You have mechanical properties, like strain and stress and the whole thing. Like in here, this is all mechanical properties, like hardness and other properties. You have also the shape. The shape, it needs to be in certain size. It needs to have this. I'm going to show it to you in a second from now, what you call here, this stuff that you're looking here. It's not really called drips, right? We call it deformation. So this stuff here that you're looking at, 
this can be here provide the bond between the rebar and the concrete we call this deformation and if you walk in the stm they call this deformation the formation size and the spacing is going to be all specified in the stm so not any steel you can just call it like a615 right a615 you need to specify lots of things including the size the shape the color and the whole thing so i'm going to say which one is most likely to be used you can say 615 by default this is the one available in the market and this is the one if i didn't mention it means a615 and it's gonna be grade 60. it's gonna be like the standard if you go to the home depot or any place that you don't see a sign for exactly which rebar most likely it's gonna be a615 grade 60. If you place an order and you did not specify, they're going to get you 615, grade 60. Not 75, because 75 is a special order. Say OK. Also, in the ASTM, A615 or 706, you can see here the bar size. With the bar size, we go with bar number, number 3, 4, 5, all the way to 11. Look here. Here is the nominal diameter of the bar. Number three means what? Three eight one inch, right? Number four is four eight one inch, which means half inch. Therefore, number eight is gonna be an inch diameter. Is this exactly an inch diameter? I'm gonna say no, not exactly. There's certain tolerance here, meaning it could be 1.02, or it could be maybe 0.95 of an inch for the damper, it's gonna be acceptable. And all of that also indicated in the ASTM specification for the A615. So I'm gonna see here nominal, which means it's about this size. Now, once you know the size, how would you figure out the cross section area of the rebar? You say, you need to take it from this table. You cannot do the math. You cannot take one inch and say, let me calculate here one inch diameter how much this is going to be. You cannot do it this way. If you do that, this is wrong. You're going to be getting different number. So I'm going to say, don't do pi d squared divided by four. Don't do pi r squared. No, you cannot do it. So I'm going to say, what do you call this? We call this d sub b. There is b here. It's going to be lower, you know, d sub b, the bar damp. How about this one? What do you call this? I'm going to call this A sub B. Cross section area of the bar. So this is going to be here. This B is going to be subscript. Same thing as this B here. Once you start here to practice concrete design, you'll memorize all of these numbers. I'm going to say, how about here in our case? We're just taking the course. You say, because you're taking the course, when you're doing the homework, you're going to have this available. In your midterm or final exam, I'm going to provide this to you. So again, please do not try to figure out this cross-section area based on the this diameter and do pi r squared. It doesn't work this way. I say, okay, let's slide in this set here. Here's the standard rebar. What does it mean by this 60? It means a grade. You see grade, what is a grade? I'm gonna say grade is the yield strength, like this. They call this grade 40, grade 60, grade 75. So grade is the yield strength. And this is what we use in our analysis. This 60 KSI. And this gave be also the bar size. You're gonna be, see it here, printed on the bar. You can see it there. And the source of the bar, I don't really care about this. Right, but what I care about that the bar itself is gonna have some deformation and this deformation is gonna be very important to provide the bond between the bar and the concrete. Any questions? Yes. No questions? All right, now slide set number two. Professor. Yes. I'm um, sorry, I was trying to figure it out, but uh, what, what did it mean when 
there was uh, no marking for the last one, or there was just a line. Here? Yes. Which one? What are you talking about? Um, like on the left, how there's no 60, there's just a line at the bottom. No, just the line at the bottom, and then you may have a space, and then you have 60. But usually you're going to see the grade. And look at this. It says grade line. It's going to be one line only. So some rebars, the grading comes like this. You see the deformation? And if you just have here one line, it means grade 60. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. But in your exam, I'm not going to give you a picture and say, figure out the grade. We'll not do this, right? It's going to be given to you. All right. So again, we understand that concrete is very good in compression. It takes compression while reinforcing bars is going to be very good in tension. But also they can support compression. But in a case like this, you need to contain them in concrete to prevent buckling of the ribbon. You see how about concrete? Does it say that concrete cannot take any tension? Yes, yeah, concrete can take very slight amount of tension. But in actual practice, I cannot depend on it. I don't count on it. I just assume that there's nothing. So this is what the ACI says. ACI says, if you're doing a design for a building, you consider the concrete to be have no strength at all in tension. Concrete is going to be good in compression. Steel is going to be good in tension and compression. I said, so, okay. This course here, the whole thing is about reinforcing concrete, right? We do reinforce concrete. We don't do plain concrete. But in this slide set, we'd like to study here the performance of sections, concrete sections and concrete members with no reinforcing bars, if this makes sense to you. So why do we do this? Because we'd like to study the performance of the concrete member without adding the rebars, so that we understand what is going to be the importance of adding the rebars. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to produce or make a design for a beam without rebars. Does that make sense? Any concrete beam, concrete column, footing, slab, I will need to add rebars. There is no way that I'm going to be doing a beam or a column or footing or a wall without rebars. But the question is, what is the effect of adding the rebars? This is why we have one full set on this uncracked reinforced concrete sections. Why it is uncracked? Because the amount of load is going to be very small on it. And this is just to understand the performance of sections before we add the rebars, if this makes sense to you guys. So in no way that I'm going to be using any of the equations in the slide set to do a design, just to understand it. When you have a concrete member and it's supposed to passive moment, what's passive moment? Passive moment is going to be causing tension at the bottom, compression at the top. We know that. I'm going to say it means here, I'm going to have here compression. I'm going to say C. And here, I'm going to have tension at the bottom. So if I'd like to put three bars here, where should I put it? On the top or the bottom? I'm going to say on the bottom. Now, this is not going to be axial tension. This is going to be flexural tension and compression. It's not axial loading here. So I'm going to say in a case like this, if I need to add rebars, I would rather add it at the bottom. Correct? Why? Because this is where the concrete is going to crack. And I need to stop the cracking. I need something to be able, some material, to take the tension on the bottom of the beam. So I would add here some rebars. We call this going to be positive moment. Why this positive moment? Positive moment is a moment causing tension in the bottom of the beam. If you flip the moment here and make it the other way around, I'm going to call it here negative moment. Someone's going to say, is this clockwise? I'm going to say no. Is this clockwise? I'm going to say no. Don't think about clockwise or counterclockwise, because actually this is going to be the same moment. 
And this moment here is causing tension at the bottom. I'm going to call this passive moment. So someone's going to say, is it passive moment because it is counterclockwise? I'm going to say, no, not because of that. Because it's causing tension at the bottom and compression at the top. Previously, you guys have studied curvature. Anyone recall definition of curvature? Deflection. Deflection and curvature. Maybe curvature, no? The term curvature? Is that a uh, camber? No, curvature. You guys studied in calculus and math and... Oh. Okay. Yeah. Stuff that we don't want to go there. You know, as engineers, we don't really like math as engineers. I'm not sure if you guys know this or not. We would like to think about the logic solution, the performance of the member, and use the math to help us to quantify and decide on our design. But we are not mathematicians, right? If I'm talking here a stress of, let's say, 50 PSI, I'm not going to say 50.325. I'm not going to go that crazy after numbers because at the end, I'm going to employ this into a design. So as engineers, we are not mathematicians. We don't like to go through equations, differential equations, stuff like this, unless we really need it to understand the performance. But we are not really after this type of business. This gave be differential equation from the second degree. Why is giving the deflection? So when you say Y double dashes, what does it mean by that? Give be differential equation, differentiate it once, differentiate it twice, you get the curvature. And what is the curvature? It is the inverse of the curvature radius. So if you think about this beam, it's going to be like a section of a circle. And this is going to be the radius of the circle. One divided by the radius of the circle is going to be called the curvature. Make sense? You see, I don't really care about the solution of this. This is when you differentiate y to the x twice. It's going to be 2dy by dx squared. I'm going to call this going to be the second derivative. And second derivative is going to be called the curvature, which is the inverse of 1 over the curvature radius. I'd like here to use it. I'm not going to be saying where this is coming from. I don't care about this. All right? And the curvature is going to be equal to the strain in the concrete divided by one half of the depth. I'm going to be going through this in a second from now. So here's a concrete section. And this gave me the standard symbol that we use in concrete member and design. The width of the beam, we call it B. This gave me the width of the beam, right? H is giving the total depth of the section or the beam. We call this total depth. How about D? What is D? What's the difference between D and H? You can see H is a total from here to there. But if you put some reinforcing bars at the bottom to resist the tension, I'm going to call here the total cross section area. All, all of these three bars is going to be called AS. I'm going to say, how about an area of just one rebar? Just one rebar. What do you call it? A sub B. You remember A sub B? Yeah, area for just one rebar. What is A sub S? Cross section area of all the rebars. So it's going to be A sub S. The other one's going to be A sub B for just one rebar. If you go to the distance from the top compression fibers to the centroid of this reinforcing bars, I'm going to call it here D. What do we call this? Effective depth. So what's the effective depth? Depth from the compression to the center of the rebars. Total depth from the compression all the way to the bottom of the beam. Any questions? Now, I guess now we have an idea about the terminology that we use here in beams. So later on, I'm not going to say B and explain it because you know the beam is a width, right? And H is going to be the total depth. And D is going to be the effective depth. And AB, one rebar cross-section area. 
AS is going to be the total cross section areas for all the rebars and tension. So now we know that. So the question is if I don't have any rebars, just imagine that I have a beam with no rebars. What's going to happen? You start to apply moment to it. See, this moment is going to be causing here compression, here tension. Now, at the beginning, the material is going to be homogeneous. What does it mean by homogeneous? It means it's going to be made of one material. Once you add the bars here, it means it's going to be becoming non-homogeneous because you're adding new material. But imagine that you just have concrete. At certain point, the concrete is going to crack. This is what we ignore in our design, but I'd like to see what is the actual performance. So again, I want you guys to remember, this slide said it's all about the performance of concrete. It's not about design of concrete. So it says here, concrete is going to fail at, you see this FCR, the model of rupture. They say concrete is going to start here to crack at the bottom once you approach the stress of 7.5 is root of F prime C. What is F prime C? Anyone remembers F prime C? The compressive. Concrete strength, compressive concrete strength. At what days, at how many days? You see, okay. at 28 days. You see, good. So I remember that we said, let's say 3,000, 4,000, right? Is it 4,000 PSI? If I decide to go with this number or 4K SI, which number would you use? 4K SI. All right. You remember what I said about ACI? Is it PSI code or KSI code? I said in all the equations, if you are working with the ACI equation, it has to be in pound and inches. So let me put this here. ACI code is PSI. Everything needs to be in PSI. Let me put a box here. Everything needs to be in PSI. Remember this. You cannot use KSI in the equations. This means I cannot really use this for KSI. I will have to use 4,000 PSI in this equation because there is a big difference between square root of 4,000 or square root of 4. Just imagine, for sake of discussion, I decide to use here 4,000 PSI. Can you get me FCR for that? So I'm going to put it right here. Can I say, and I need someone to help me with this, with the calculator, F prime C equals 4,000 PSI. Can you get me FCR equals to how much? If I use 4,000 in this equation, I'm going to use in here, I'm going to be using 4,000. Yes? Four seventy four point three four. All right. Four seventy four point three psi. Even I mean in in psi, I would just do it like this, right? Now I need help in figuring out f prime f c r f. I used for f prime c just four. Let's say that I did a mistake, right? I'm trying to use to compare between the two values. So I'm gonna say FCR equals, now use this equation F, this is four, and tell me how much would you get? I'm gonna say 15. how much? 15 KSI, correct? Because mm -hmm. I assume that all units here is gonna be KSI. This means what? Means what? 15,000 PSI. Yes. Wow, which one is correct now? Is it 474 PSI or 15,000? The 474. Yeah, the 474. Just think about it this way. Are you telling me that concrete is really bad in tension, right? Concrete is going to be bad in tension. And when I use 4,000 concrete, the maximum compression, would I be getting 474 PSI in tension or 15,000, which is much higher than 4,000? See, concrete cannot take any tension. I just ignore the tension when it comes to analysis. So there is no way to use this. I'm going to put here, I'm going to put here, big X, do not do it this way. This code is PSI code. You cannot really use KSI. This is going to be the one that you need to use. 
Okay. In the previous slide that I showed you, when it comes to bending flexural stresses, you can say in this slide set, you guys remember this from mechanics of materials. I asked you to study this, right? And if you remember the stress distribution, you see the stress here distribution. This one you have positive moment. You can have your tension, and here's gonna be compression. I'm gonna say, okay, same principle. I'd like to use it here. Here we go. Here's the stress distribution due to positive moment. At the bottom, I'm gonna have tension. On the top, I'm gonna have your compression. Here's the stress distribution again. Here's the tension, and here's the compression. Do we have an equation that controls this analysis? I'm gonna say, yes, here's the equation. It says the stress sigma which in our case here, you may use F. If you remember that we'd like to use F for the stress, you can use F instead of sigma. It would be okay in concrete analysis. It's gonna be equal to the moment divided by the moment of inertia. You guys recall the moment of inertia, the meaning of it? For rectangular section, let me give you a quick equation. I'm gonna say rectangular section. I equals B H cubed. Remember this, divide by 12 for rectangular section. Let's give you the moment of inertia. There's another thing here called section modulus, which means S is going to be equal to BH squared divided by 6. You remember that? Okay. If you don't remember it, go back to statics and mechanics of materials. You need to study that. So what do you call this I is going to be moment of inertia. And what is S? What is S? Section modulus. All right? So S is giving the section modulus and I is giving the moment of inertia for rectangular section. So, okay. It's going to be equal to the moment. What is the moment? The applied moment. We are not talking about strength. This is going to be the applied moment. Divide by the moment of inertia, applied by Y. What is Y here? Let me zoom in. Y is going to be the distance from the center of the beam at which I have here zero stress to the point of interest. So the stress at this point here is going to be equal to M divided by Y, divide, M divided by I times Y. I'm going to be interested in the maximum stress because it says here, once the tensile stress at the bottom of the beam reaches FCR, we'll consider the beam to be cranked. So in a case like this, I'm gonna say, what is the maximum value for Y? Maximum value for Y is gonna be the distance from here to there. The rectangular section is gonna be also the distance from here to there. And I'm gonna be using the symbol C lowercase for it. So what is C? C is gonna be the distance here, which means H over two. So I can put it here, I'm going to say C equals H over two. Because the rectangular section is going to be symmetrical. You see this H over two? This is what I call here C. So what does it mean by B? It's going to be the width. You can say, okay, let's look here at the stress distribution. You're going to have your compression at the top and tension at the bottom, right? I can do integration for this stress distribution. Meaning, if you take here, this gives me sigma C, which means here for us, you can call it FC if you want to, F prime C, right? With the concrete. And this sigma C, the tension stress is gonna be the same as, this tension stress is gonna be the same as the compression stress when it comes to value, as long as the beam is not cracked yet. So we'd like to study it at the cracking point. And why do we do this again? We're not gonna design it for that, but we'd like to see where do we need to add the reinforcing bars? Because when the beam is gonna crack, it means it's gonna be collapsing, especially if there is no reinforcing. If there is reinforcing, it's okay because reinforcing is going to be taking the tension. But in a case like this, if the beam has no reinforcing bars, 
it's gonna start to crack, the beam is gone. And this is where you need to start to add rebars to it. So here we're trying to study what's the importance of the use of this rebars in a concrete section. So before the concrete cracks, I'm gonna say I have here tension force, compression force. This compression force is gonna be equal to this stress distribution, right? If you do integration of this, if you do the volume of this stress, it's gonna give you the compression. The volume of this is gonna give you tension. So this is like a couple, right? Two forces parallel to each other, they have the same value and they have a distance of this. How much is the C force? for the tension force. I'm gonna say tension force. You wanna calculate the tension force? So, okay, let's see how this to be calculated out. Tension force equals the maximum stress. I'm gonna say, yes, I understand that. What's the maximum stress? I'm gonna say FC. The maximum stress, which means this value here, or this value here, multiplied by C. Why multiplied by C? Because I want trying to find out the volume of this prism. So it's going to be equal to the stress value applied by C, applied by B, divided by 2. Does this make sense to you guys? Right? The volume of this prism, of this triangular prism, is going to be equal to the stress times the height, which means C. Divided by 2 is going to be area of this triangle. Multiplied by the width B is going to get you the volume of this. And the volume of the stress distribution is what we call here the tension force, which is going to be also the same as the compression force. Don't forget that C equals T. These two forces should be equal to each other. To understand it more, you say summation of the force in the X direction should be equal to zero. There is no other forces, but just C and T. Therefore, C is going to be equal to T. Now, where is this force concentrated and located at? Let me stay here. Let's say, here's the tension force, here's the compression force. Tension force is gonna be coming this way, right? Compression force is gonna be coming like this. I'd like to see where is this at? I'm gonna say this has to be at one third from the bottom because this gives be the centroid of this triangle. It means it's gonna be at C divided by three from here. See here this distance? One third of C. This distance here is going to be equal to one third of C. Same thing from the top. Am I correct? So, how much is the distance from here from the tension to the compression? I'm going to call it here JD. The question is how can I figure out this distance? I'm going to say this distance, I can simply say is going to be equal to. Height H minus C divided by three minus C divided by three. And how much is C? We say it's gonna be H over two, correct? You remember? C equals H over two. So it's gonna be equal to H subtracting. Now let's do it together. It's gonna be H over six minus H over six, which means H over three for both of them. This means this distance JD is going to be equal to two thirds times H. The distance here is going to be equal to two thirds times H. Because of this two forces, two coupled, or, or these two forces, right? Tension, compression, this couple. If you want to see here how much is the moment developed by this couple, you can say here this moment is equal to what? A moment equals to T or C because they're all the same, right? So I'm going to say T times, times what? Times two thirds of H, which means times JD, times this distance. Any moment is going to be equal to the force multiplied by the distance between the two forces between this column. So we're going to say times two thirds of H. And this is going to be the moment that this beam is able to resist. So when the beam here is going to start to crack the stress at the bottom is going to be reaching fcr so we're going to say this is going to be fcr right so i'm going to say what is fcr i forgot what are you talking about you can say let's go back 
What is F'C? I'm going to say concrete clearance and compression. What is FCR? I'm going to say this is going to be the stress at which the beam is going to start to crack. How do I know it from here? Concrete is considered to be cracked on the stress. And the tension side reaches the stress of FCR. Is it okay? So I guess now I understand where is the cracking moment come from. So the cracking moment, M, is going to be tension time two thirds of H, is going to happen at once the stress of the bottom of the concrete is going to be reaching FCR. I guess this is going to be a good stopping point. Um, please sign out, type your name in the chat box, the chat room. And if you have any questions, hang out. Thank you, Professor. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks. All right. Uh, sorry, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I was a bit late. I was wondering what 